God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of Jesus, our hope. Amen. Well, the Advent season has arrived. Happy Advent to all of you. Our culture calls it at best uh, the Christmas season, but more frequently simply the holiday season. But regardless of what it's called, uh, we all know it as the giving season. Uh, gifts given and gifts received to those whom we love and from those we love, but soon and very soon enough, our giving season will come to an end. God's giving season? God's giving season is 24-7, 365, and today God comes down to give to you. God's good and perfect gift for us this Advent season is a clean heart, and who among us doesn't want that? I want you to imagine with me. Open up your, imagine, your imagination and imagine with me, if you will, a dad... Uh, and this dad, well, he has a family, and the family is preparing for their annual uh, vacation. Now, being a very conscientious father, he wants to make sure that everything is all squared away before they leave. So he walks out into his garage, and, and he's going to unplug the compressed air tank, which, of course, has been constantly cycling on and off. So he reaches down to unplug it, but unbeknownst to him, he unplugs the family freezer. Instead, the family climbs into their SUV and they leave for vacation. Now, by the way, uh, this is a summer vacation in August when it gets really, really hot. And did I mention that the freezer is filled with meat? For seven sweltering summer days, this freezer sits unplugged in a hot garage. Well, the family finally returns from its fabulous vacation, and Dad thinks, you know, it's much too hot to turn the oven on this evening. Let's just cook out on the grill tonight. And so he goes to the garage, opens up the freezer, and what does he find? Yeah, an ooey, gooey, smelly mess. You've probably all seen it before. I, I know I have. But, of course, this dad knows exactly what to do. Dads, dads always know exactly what to do in times of crisis, right? He gets out this large rag and, and, and a bucket of warm, soapy water, and he begins to clean. He begins to clean the outside of the freezer. And after a few hours, the outside of the freezer is spotless. It is squeaky clean. It can pass a marine boot camp inspection. The inside, though, rancid, reeking, and dare I say, rotten. So the dad says to himself, you know what? I'd stink, too, if I had the social life of a machine sitting out in a garage. Uh, so he knows the solution. He says, a party is going to solve all problems. Let's throw my freezer a party. And so he invites all the appliances from the neighborhood. They come, and it is a great party. They yuck it up with some jokes about limited warranties. And the blenders, uh, brace yourself. The blenders, they mix it up with everyone. The dad opens up the freezer, a still a putrid, polluted mess. I know what this freezer needs, says the dad. This freezer needs some status, some status. Stat status cures all problems. So this dad gets the freezer the latest and greatest iPhone. You know, say hello to the future, an iPhone 10 with all of the best apps. The dad also gets the freezer an American Express gold card. Wow, this freezer now has status. And dare I say it, uh, brace yourself again, this freezer is cool. <laughs> Still got a problem on the inside, though. Finally, the dad says, I know, uh, I know, if a party doesn't solve it and status doesn't solve it, you know what solves all problems? A relationship, a relationship, a companion, that'll do it, uh, that'll do it. So there's this cute Frigidaire uh, just down the block, and the dad tries to match his freezer with the Frigidaire. Brace yourselves again. Uh, the cute Frigidaire gives the freezer the cold shoulder. <laughs> okay, all right, you say, enough of this, enough of this. Who in the world would be crazy enough to focus on the outside when the problem is obviously on the inside? Now, I'm not sure that you want to know the answer to that question. There's a mom 
who is continuously lobbing verbal bombs at her children. They are lethal, they are nuclear, and they leave behind these huge destructive craters. And finally, she starts uh, to feel a little bit guilty about it. And, and what's her solution? A girl's day out at a fine restaurant and a shopping spree at her favorite mall. Who's crazy enough to focus on the outside when the interior is a stinking mess? There, there's a husband. This husband is, is locked in a three-year affair. It is thrilling beyond all thrills. But it also brings him a massive amount of shame and despair and depression. His solution? His solution is to get a new circle of friends who will affirm his deceitful lifestyle. You're thinking, what, what's the point of all of this, Pastor? You kind of lost me when the dad started treating the freezer as though it's a person. Well, uh, the point is this. Our sinful nature addresses the outside and ignores the inside. It addresses the outside and ignores the inside. You all know that. You do it all the time. So do I. We're all hurting, hurting on the inside, and, and we know that we're broken, and we are trapped, and we stink to high heaven. And what's our knee-jerk reaction? Focus on the outside and ignore the inside. And Isaiah says that that makes everything really, really ugly. In one of the most scathing rebukes upon this outside propensity that you and I have, Isaiah says, he says to look at the inside. He says, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and the, the wind sweeps our sins away. All of us, Isaiah says. You ready to own that today? You ready to own those three words? All of us, pastor and parishioner, all of us have become like one who is unclean. There's filth. There's filth in the freezer. It's really unclean. Isaiah says, all of our righteous acts, this is when you are at your most spiritual. You know, this is when you have this spiritual quiver in your liver, an ocean of emotion. And Isaiah says, even your righteous acts are like filthy rags. He goes on, we all shrivel up like a leaf. And of course, we see a lot of shriveled up leaves this time of the year. And then he says, like the wind, our sins sweep us away. How many of you see those dry, shriveled up leaves recently on windy days? And how many of you seen those leaves kind of cry out, I'm hunkering down, we're throwing out the anchor, and we're going to really hold the line today in this wind? No, no, no. Of course, it doesn't happen that way at all. Like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And you know what that's like. <laughs> you know, you're just overwhelmed with this sinful desire, and like a shriveled up leaf, you're, you're blown away. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And what does Isaiah mean by that word, unclean? This is what Isaiah confesses in chapter 6 of his book. He says, I'm unclean. I'm unclean, and I live in the midst of a people who are unclean. So what does it mean when a biblical prophet says that something or someone is unclean? Well, we can find the answer in the book of Leviticus, your, your favorite biblical book, I know, in chapter 13 of Leviticus. The person with such an infectious disease, Isaiah says. Think of something like, well, like, like Ebola. You know, it's, it's infectious, it's, it's contagious. Uh, in the ancient Near East, in Israel, uh, you didn't have, you know, quarantine, kind of like you do today. You can lock people away in a room. This is what the people did. They'd wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face, and they would cry out, unclean, unclean. So when Isaiah says, I'm unclean in chapter 6, and when he says in chapter 64, verse 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, Isaiah is saying that we have an infectious disease. We have a contagious disease, and it's called sin. It's almost like, you know, everybody I meet, I say, you know, hello, my name is David Shoddy, but don't get too close because I can infect you with, with my sin, and I could kill you. We all need to be quarantined, don't we? We're all walking around with this inside sickness that is contagious and it infects and it kills so many people. We need to be quarantined not just for 21 days. We all need to be quarantined for the rest of our lives. It's that contagious. 
And don't be fooled. On the outside, you may look fit as a fiddle. But on the inside, there is a bunch of filth in your freezer. So what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about this filth in your freezer? Well, there are some options that we have. Again, our propensity is to focus on the outside and ignore the inside, right? So, so first, first we, we can blame it. Blame it. It's not my fault. It's my spouse's fault. It's my child's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's the church's fault. It is Bush's fault. Pick your poison, but don't own it. That's the key here. Don't own it. Because we want to focus on the outside, not the inside. And, of course, this is as old as, as Adam and Eve, isn't it? The man said uh, to God, uh, taking it just like a man, what, what does Adam do when he's confronted with the filth in his freezer? Taking it like a man, he places the blame on someone else. The woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. You want to be a lame person, a weak person, then, then just blame everyone else. Blame everyone else. Well, another option would be to take it and, and to stuff it. Uh, stuff it. So you come to worship day and you hear a sermon like this and you say, uh-uh, nah-uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going there. No way. Uh, we don't talk about stuff like this uh, in our marriage. It's off limits. You stuff it down. That's what King David did. King David, in Psalm 32, when I kept silent, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I'm just going to stuff it down. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Stuffing down the filth in your freezer only makes things worse. You know that, don't you? I mean, it's, it's kind of like a toxic waste. <laughs> you bury it out of sight, out of mind, but sooner or later this toxic waste will bubble up and it will infect and it will destroy everything. So we can blame it or we can stuff it. What's another option? Well, a third option would be to measure it. Measure it. You know what that looks like, don't you? There's a wonderful, great picture of this in Luke chapter 18. You know that picture. You've gazed at it thousands of times. You see it in the mirror regularly. A Pharisee and a tax collector, they go up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, well, he sees the filth in his freezer, and he just says, I'm going to measure it. I'm going to measure my filth against that guy's filth. The filth, the tax collector's filth. And you know what? Of course, w when you measure it against someone else, well, I can look pretty clean, right? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. I have people come up to me occasionally and say something like this. You know, Pastor Shadi, you know what? I... I'm doing just fine. I'm doing fine according to my own standards. There is nothing wrong with me whatsoever. According to my standards, I am pretty darn good. What about God's standards? What about those Ten Commandments? So is there a better way? Is there a better way than, than to blame it or stuff it or, or measure it? Is there a better way uh, to look at the filth and the stench of my life? All of us have become what? Like one who is unclean, is there a better way? In one of the greatest confessions of sin in the whole Bible, Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 8, Isaiah says, in so many words, he says to us, put it out on the table, quit hiding it, quit playing games, and confess it. Confess it. And this is what Isaiah says as he begins his confession. He says, oh, oh that you, of course, he's speaking to God, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Come down. Come down and deal with this. We can't shove it under the rug. We can't hide it under the bed. We can't hide the filth in our freezer. God, you need to do something because this is contagious and this is infectious and, and people are dying here. God, come down. 
And in these words, Isaiah is recalling Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. In that setting, in Exodus, uh, Israel said, we're stuck here. We're stuck here in Egypt. Talk about filth in the freezer. Israel was stuck in it up to their necks. And they confessed it. They cried out, God, come down. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, God comes down. And there is a burning bush, and Moses has a rod. And Israel rock, walks through the Red Sea on dry ground. And Isaiah says, God, you did it once. You came down once. Do it again. Do it again. Rend the heavens and come down. Tear them open and come down. And Isaiah's prayer is answered. Isaiah's prayer is answered in Christ Jesus. We just spoke these beautiful words from the Nicene Creed, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Confess it, confess it, cry out, God, come down. <laughs> and when God comes down, Isaiah says that he does things that we don't expect. Look at this awesome verse, 64, verse 3, for when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. When God came down in Jesus Christ, his first miracle was to take water and turn it into wine. No one expected that. When Jairus' daughter was dead, Jesus resurrected her. No one expected that. Jesus takes all of the filth from our freezers upon himself and his body on the cross. He let himself be torn and tattered. He became unclean so that you and I could be cleansed inside by his blood. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. And absolutely no one, no one expected that. So why would this, this holy, this righteous, eternal, beautiful, glorious, gracious God send his sinless son into the filth of our freezer and come down and do awesome things that no one expected? Why would God do that? Isaiah tells us, his confession continues. He says, yet, O Lord, you are our father. Our Father, that's what a good and gracious Father does when his children are stuck in the filth. He sends a rescue. <laughs> Our oldest child, Richard, uh, when he was all of about three and a half years old, uh, he went to his mother with a sort of a confession. You see, he had gotten a hold of a pair of scissors, and he had taken those scissors, and he cut his hair. <laughs> he looked like a mangy dog. Patty looked at him and says something like this to Richard. She says, Richard, is that a good thing to do? And he responds, of course, no. You know, she says, Richard, uh, what do mom and dad do when you play with the scissors? And kiddos, by the way, don't play with the scissors. The scissors are off limits, right? So she says, what does dad do to you when you play with the scissors? And he says something like, well, dad spanks me. Well, what should he do this time? And he says, love, love me. Wouldn't you like to have a father who is like that all the time? To have a father who is at his best when we are at our worst. To have a father who is strongest when we are at our weakest. To have a father who, who lifts us up upon his lap and he heals us and forgives us and cleans up our mess. That's the father you have in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. That's the father you have in Jesus Christ. So why then would you take the filth in your freezer and, and blame it on someone else? That's not fair to do to people that you love and live with. Why would you stuff it? Why would you want to measure it against your own lame standards? Unconfessed sin is a burden that you were not meant to bear. Even if you've fallen, even if you've failed, even if everyone else has rejected you, Christ will not turn away from you. He comes down to those who have no hope. He goes to those who, who no one else would go to, the unclean, all of us. So it's very clear today. God says to you and to me, he says, I invite you to look at your unclean heart and what? Confess it. 
confess it to your loving Father who still does things that we do not expect. He's done it before, and today he will do it again. How can I be so sure of that? Well, you know the answer to that question. It's the answer that Isaiah gives to us throughout his book. His name is Jesus. There is no other book in the Bible that tells us more about Jesus Christ's glory and power and majesty and mercy and grace and love. There's no one else like Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be what? As white as snow. Isaiah 7, verse 14, you will call him Emmanuel, God with us in the mess, in the filth, in the muck, in the mire. Isaiah 25, verse 8, I will swallow up death forever. The death of death is coming to a place near you. Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open up his mouth. No protest from Jesus. Chapter 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Chapter 65, verse 7, this same Jesus crucified and risen is returning. And in Isaiah 65, verse 17, he says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more filth, no more filth in any freezer. All of this... All of this and so much more to the end that we exchange our unclean hearts for a clean heart and a new spirit. That is God's good and perfect gift for you. It is time to claim it, to celebrate it, and to live it. So let's all stand and join in singing it. Amen.